Hello everyone, and welcome to the 184th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring the characters and themes of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. It's always a mystery whether or not a new entry in a franchise will elevate it to greater heights, or lower it to a laughingstock of its medium, and I, and many of you, seem to be pleasantly surprised that Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes was quite the decent film. Was it as good as the previous entries in the series? In many ways, yes it was, and since I've seen a number of requests from all of you to cover this film, I figured I would do just that. In Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, we're presented with a few different narratives that are both familiar and new, with Proximus Caesar being a terror very reminiscent of what Koba could have been, a video on whom I made over a year ago now, and the humans who present their own threat as they attempt to regain the world that they lost. Well in this video, we're going to examine the intricacies of both, delving once again into an alternate world where apes are on the rise that presents us with so much to discuss in regard to morality. But before we begin, let's talk about our sponsor for this video, War Thunder. War Thunder is an action-packed large-scale multiplayer game featuring vehicles, aircraft, and naval vessels that you can fight with in epic battles on fields all across the world. And the best part is, you aren't restricted by platform, as War Thunder is available on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and Mac. With a bevy of available tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships that includes all the iconic machines and lesser-known prototypes from the mid-20th century to the present, War Thunder perfectly replicates the intensity and scale of gargantuan military battles, turning what would be your run-of-the-mill shooter experience into nothing short of a Hollywood blockbuster sensation that fully immerses you in every aspect of warfare. Each machine and piece of equipment has been tinkered with down to the last atom to make everything you experience as accurate as possible, and in War Thunder, you have access to all military technologies to make your playing experience as expansive as possible, with guided missiles, active protection systems, smoke screens, night vision devices, reconnaissance and strike drones, and even a nuclear strike that can flatten the entire map. And whether you're a fan of rushing through the front lines with a tank or flying overhead to scout out and eliminate the enemy from afar, War Thunder has you covered on all fronts. With their new update Alpha Strike, there's even more to get excited about, as War Thunder has now introduced both modern and classic Hungarian aviation, and a new map, North Holland, which allows for intense aviation and tank battles in a delightfully destructible environment. But don't just take my word for it. Try it out for yourself today completely free by clicking the link down in the description, where all new players and those who haven't played War Thunder for half a year or more will receive some special bonuses, rentals for the P-40E1 aircraft and M4 tank for a week, along with free unique skins for them, a special decorator, Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, three premium vehicles for free, a week of premium account access, and even more gifts. But don't delay, the American vehicle bonus season will end soon, so make sure you click that link down below and head to the battlefield today. Thank you War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, let's begin. 300 years after Caesar's demise, the world of men has all but crumbled, the legacy of the mighty human civilization reduced to ruinous rusting towers and solemn stone constructs abandoned to time. But in the ashes of a broken world, a new one rises to take its place one dominated by primitive ape societies akin to what our own must have looked like thousands of years prior to the present day. One such example is the Eagle Clan that our hero of this story hails from. The Eagle Clan is a prime example of a small, tight-knit, egalitarian community that have flourished in our own society at different points in our history. A world that finds safety, prosperity, and happiness in its simplicity. One where each individual works for the benefit of the group that's really only possible in small homogenous communities like these. As admirable as this particular ape society is, as was evident by the actions of Koba many centuries ago, apes aren't much different from humans, and our primate cousins have inherited some of the darker aspects of the sentient experience that we also derive from our more primal emotions, namely our fear of the unknown and those different from us, and our drive to conquer and dominate, which is what drives the central antagonist of this story, Proximus Caesar. Long ago, the first Caesar laid down the laws that would guide the apes towards prosperity. Ape not kill ape, and apes together strong. Rules that would ensure that the newly sentient apes had a foundation with which they could form a cohesive society that's free from the infighting that so often plagues civilizations. But Caesar's laws were never set in stone, rather they were an oral tradition. And though I'm sure apes like Maurice did their best to continue on Caesar's legacy after his passing, with each new generation and the fragmented clans of apes that popped up throughout the world, things were bound to be forgotten. Or in the case of Proximus Caesar, warped into something wicked. Proximus Caesar, whose name translates to next or nearest Caesar, has set himself up as king of the apes at the time this film has begun. And while I'm sure at one point Proximus led a clan that was much like the Eagle Clan, there were three people that heavily influenced the way that Proximus would choose to lead his clan and form his kingdom. Raka and his partner, Entrevathan. Unlike Noah's Eagle Clan, 
Proximus Caesar knows of the first Caesar and his laws, and considering that he mentions that he knows who Raka is, I'm going to assume that Raka was the one that educated Proximus about the ape's sacred laws, and I'm sure that for a time, Proximus led his clan according to the true interpretation of these ideals, and all was well. But then came the conquest of whatever human holdout Trevathan belonged to, and after taking Trevathan prisoner, he gave Proximus something that's infinitely more dangerous than any weapon ever could be in the wrong hands, an education. When May first encounters Trevathan, she picks up a book by Kurt Vonnegut, which prompts Trevathan to begin speaking about Vonnegut's musings on the Roman Empire, to which May replies by stating that Trevathan must have been teaching Proximus about the Roman Empire, a fact that he confirms. Now there's a lot to admire about the Roman Empire and the system they built, but there's also quite a lot that is less than admirable, namely the fact that it was an empire that routinely engaged in conquest, slavery, and authoritarian governmental structure that caused not only immense suffering for others, but internal strife that harmed their own people. When Trevathan was regaling Proximus with Roman history though, Proximus wasn't interested in the slightest in the virtuous aspects of ancient Rome, just the despicable, and from these tales, he not only discovered the concepts of conquest, slavery, kingdom, and empire, but he also learned of the original human Caesar, Julius Caesar, and all the emperors that came after him, the man who became dictator for life of the Roman Republic, and paved the way for the creation of the Roman Empire. With this new knowledge in hand, Proximus formed a not-so-unique ideology that conveniently ignored Caesar's ape-not-kill-ape rule, and focused only on his apes-together strong rule, using this maxim to enact the forced assimilation of all ape tribes into a single kingdom placed under his rule, shirking the egalitarian ways that many of the individual clans and Caesar's successors promoted, in favor of creating a caste system that consolidated power in the hands of Proximus's elites, while the rest of the apes under his rule were organized into lower classes, most of which he's forcibly assimilated into his kingdom by sending out his armies to conquer all tribes and clans with the cattle prod-esque weapons that Trevathan fashioned for him. So while Proximus's name is intended to invoke the name of the ape Caesar, it's more so the case that Proximus is the latest incarnation of the Roman Caesar, and he lets the ideals of the true first Caesar dictate how he orders his world, more so than his progenitors. But aside from enriching and empowering himself, Proximus actually seems to have the interests of the apes as a whole in mind when conducting his affairs. Sending his armies to conquer other clans and murder resistant apes, while enslaving the rest, is as horrid as it sounds, but Proximus's goals in this story are to gain access to the technology locked away in this government's safe house, use said technology to eradicate the existing humans, to ensure that ape society can flourish without having to worry about a rival society rising up to crush it, and to facilitate the rapid evolution of the apes so they might quickly reach the glory of the now lost modern human society. Like Koba centuries ago, Proximus distrusts the humans, believing, and perhaps rightfully so, that should the humans manage to achieve the intelligence they lost and reform their world, that the apes would go back to being nothing more than zoo animals and primitive creatures, or worse, would be eradicated by the resurgent humans as they clawed their way back to supremacy over the earth. And what seems to confirm Proximus's suspicions are the actions of one of the central characters of this story, May. Most humans after the simian flu was unleashed upon the world lost their intelligence in their speech. But by May's era, small sects of humans have been born that are immune to the virus's effects. And May's goal in this film is to infiltrate the vault that Proximus has claimed for his own, to obtain a deciphering key that will re-establish a satellite communications network that her tribe has been working on for an unspecified period of time, which as we can see upon their success at the end of the film, will likely lead to global contact lines between humans being re-established, which will then allow the remaining intelligent humans to organize into a resistance group that can claim their lost technology and reconquer the Earth. While these more grand goals confirm Proximus' suspicions, even on a more personal scale, when May shows herself willing to work with Noah in order to accomplish her goals, we learn that May doesn't hold her new ape comrades in high regard, and she nearly kills them all when she blows up the seawall outside the vault, and then considers killing Noah after she encounters him again at the end of the film, which shows us how hostile the average intelligent human has become towards their ape successors. Trevathan is the exception here, as being taken by the apes and made into their pet educator and source of entertainment has allowed Trevathan to live a life of comfort that few humans have experienced since civilization crumbled. And Trevathan embodies an evil of comfort, that of the oppressed supporting their oppressor due to the preferential treatment they've received from them, a traitor to his people whose cowardice and selfishness has greatly harmed human efforts to re-establish civilization. But here's the thing, no one species deserves, nor are they owed dominion over the earth. It's simply something that comes as a byproduct of sentient life, as whoever has the might to make the world theirs inherently has the right to do so. And that isn't a concept that's necessarily dictated by morality, but the laws of nature, specifically survival of the fittest. 
For the remaining intelligent humans, it makes sense that they would be searching for ways to reconquer the Earth and put down what they perceive as violent and highly dangerous hordes of apes, whose existence is only perceived as a threat to them. And for the apes, it makes sense that they would be distrustful of creatures that once used them as test subjects, pets, and zoo animals, and want to eradicate them in turn so their own future could be secured. In this version of the world, there is never going to be a time again where apes and humans aren't competing for supremacy, as the only thing that could guarantee one supremacy over the other would be a complete eradication of the other's populace. However, this film expands upon something that this series has been trying to impart upon us since the very beginning, that it doesn't have to be this way. For a good portion of this story, a human woman and a male ape work side by side together to accomplish feats they would otherwise be incapable of achieving, and it's only when the preconceived notions of May damage their relationship that this no longer becomes a possibility. What this tells us is that apes and humans can get along, and they can work together, but fear of the unknown is what's holding both species back. It's natural for us to fear any threat to our existence, and so trying to eliminate it is only more natural. But threats don't have to be eliminated, they can be neutralized as well, and the only things holding back both species here from reaching an understanding are the past and their natures. While the past is important and can only really be erased by the passage of time, what matters most is the here and now, what we choose to do each moment we draw breath. The Roman Empire is a thing of the past. The previous incarnation of human civilization has been decimated, and humans now share the world with thousands upon thousands of intelligent apes. So instead of looking to the past and fearing the unknown, why not make something greater by forging a common understanding with your fellow sentients? It's not what humans and apes could do to each other that matters. It's the refusal of the apes and humans alike to recognize that what makes them different from each other isn't what matters, but their similarities. For just as we feel happiness, love, loss, anger, and sadness, so do the apes. Violence breeds violence, warfare breeds warfare, and you can certainly achieve peace and prosperity through conflict, but you can also achieve them through unity. And you have to ask yourself, do either humans or apes really deserve to be eradicated? Or is eradication only an option because we let our primal instincts to protect and dominate rule our actions? If we stop to think for a moment about our actions instead of giving in to fear, hatred, and anger, we often find that not only are there better solutions to our interpersonal and societal problems, but that the people that ignite these feelings within us are just that, people. Of course it's not easy, and not everyone can be reasoned with, as again, it's in our natures to lash out at others, rather than invite them into our homes. But it's our willingness to rise above our natures that elevates us to greater heights, that allows us to build new worlds and create wondrous things that any other creature on the planet could scarcely imagine. In the world that we live in, how many of our problems occur because of our unwillingness to just talk to each other, to understand what others are feeling and how their worlds have affected who they are and what they think, believe, and feel, and perhaps as flesh and blood beings just like we are, they really aren't so different from us. While this is the correct path to take, again, it's not the easy one. And to call the choice to take the more violent path evil is actually erroneous, as again, it's in our nature to do so. So I'd call sentient life's propensity to meet adversity with violence and suspicion more so morally backward, as the true moral choice is the choice to embrace your perceived foe, not murder them. But it's so difficult to reach that realization for many people that at times it can seem impossible. Even more so when you factor in the effects social constructs can have on progressing to this desired outcome. When Noah sees how Proximus has ordered his kingdom and laid down his laws, he states that the laws are wrong, and indeed, sometimes they are. For unfortunately, the laws are only made lawful by those with the power to enforce them. And when a society and everyone in it is geared towards behaving and acting in certain ways, well more often than not, that's how they behave and how they act. So ultimately, that's what this film and this series in general is trying to impart upon us. That though the road towards empathizing with others is difficult, when it comes down to it, it's the path towards a secure, peaceful, and prosperous future that has the least amount of bodies strewn along it. As setting aside each other's differences and coming together, no matter how impossible that may seem at times, is the only true way to reduce death and suffering for all to its absolute minimum. However, though the concepts woven throughout this film are more so moral dilemmas than they are outright evil, Proximus represents a very real evil, as he embodies the worst aspects of everything that we've discussed throughout this video. As organizing your society into the worst forms of human governance, and taking the most abhorrent aspects of human civilization, and building ape society on those foundations for your own benefit, and sort of the benefit of your people, is an evil thing to do. And the brutish, megalomaniacal monster that was Proximus Caesar deserves to be condemned for all that he tried to do. But perhaps there's some hope for human ape relations. And as this story unfolds, maybe under the guidance of a new Caesar, the only thing that will be left to the past is evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. 
What are your thoughts on Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes? Let me know down below and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, my patrons, and anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.